Yes, welcome to the Vanguard Show on podcast, episode number 12, January 10th, 2021. The Vanguard Show has been sponsored by From Old Guard to Vanguard, the book, as well as From Old Guard to Vanguard, photo exhibit. And uh, both of those uh, items are available on Facebook for uh, anyone who needs uh, contact. And today's special guest, uh, and along with my usual co-host, Ms. <laughs> Kathleen, my wife. Hello, everyone. <laughs> our special guest today is Minister Vance Stretch Sanders. And I'm going to tell everybody, hold on, he got a lot of stuff going on. So it's going to be a long uh, uh, it, bio introduction. <laughs> uh, revolutionary activist, civil rights activist, uh, political candidate, uh, president of New Era Las Vegas, President of All Shades United, founder of the Stretch for Greatness Foundation, which I definitely want to learn more about that, uh, both of us, and the author of My Father's Best Kept Secret, The Impact, The Anger, The Healing, which we have right here. Let me go ahead and put it up for the people. And this is available on Amazon, right, brother? Absolutely. Okay, and I want to get a quick back, back uh, view here. A handsome young man. All uh, right, brother. Well, I want to open the question with, uh, you know, it was Pablo Picasso who once said that our goal in life is to discover our gift. Our purpose in life is to give it away, which means to share it. When did you first discover your gift as an organizer and uniter of people? First and foremost, I want to say, uh, comrade and Miss Kathy, I thank you guys for having me on the show. I'm extremely honored. You know, I, I believe that this has come at, at such a perfect time. What a better way to kick the new year off. And so again, I appreciate you guys for having me on the show. Absolutely. I would say that I discovered my give. Well, I got in the movement at 19, uh, June 20, June 14, 2014, I founded All Shades United, which is no longer an uh, active organization, but I am still the, you know, the founder of the organization. And I don't really feel like I really saw the potential of a minister stretch saying this time I was about 21, 22. Okay. It's when I started kind of really getting out there. My name started really getting in certain conversations. I started moving and grooving. And people started to kind of speak into me and speak towards me as if I was a community leader. I just thought I was just going to be the guy, you know, doing some good, some marches, protesting, giving out food. I never had intent to be a leader or to try to even lead our people. It was for a long time. I never even used language like leader or leadership because i didn't look at myself as a leader right. but just as time progressed my mother and different ones around me you know kept telling me trying to get me to understand who i am and how people view me so i'm responsible with my leadership because oftentimes right. when people get caught up it's because they don't really understand you know you you may be in the same room with other leaders but not every leader has the same responsibility okay. so mm -hmm. you know, as the scripture says many, um as much as given much is required so that's the best thing that really saved me, and it's still saving me, is that I, I get opportunity to really recognize more and more how serious this gift is. Not just saying I have a gift of speaking or I have a gift to bring people together, but you know, when you have a when you have a gift for people, you can put out a flyer and folks come and show up, whether it's to hear you talk or for the cause, you know, it, it's 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 the double edged sword, right? On one side. That's a beautiful gift. That's a, mm -hmm. a, a blessing to the community. But on the other side, you know, that's a that's a, a complete danger. You know, that's a dangerous gift to have. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people do not like people to speak truth to power and to do great things in the community. So I think every day I'm learning, I'm being put in different situations to show me really how imperative it is for me to be responsible with my gifts. So I have to be mindful of what I say. Sometimes I've said yeah. things, that was my personal opinion. But people was like, why would you tell them don't do X, Y, and Z? I'm like, I just said what I wasn't doing. Right. But right. people around me was like, listen, you know, you no longer have private opinions on a public platform. Right. So when you speak publicly, it's law. Right. So you can't so you can't just do the you got a vent, get get a notebook or a journal, you know, but you can't be out typing and tweeting and recording and just saying whatever comes to your head because you just want to get off your chest. It does not work like that. You need to have written statements so they can say, Hey, this is what I said. I'm gonna email it to you. So I'm learning more and more every day of just how to really navigate this gift. And it's not complicated. That doesn't mean you have to, you know, uh, you never compromise your morals or your principles. You never mm -hmm. fold or sell out your people or yourself, but you just make sure that you're responsible. But a lot of us don't really know the gift. So right. again, I would just say that the gift of what I've been blessed with, I start to really recognize it like 21, 22, but 
even present day, I'm still been put, I'm still being put in situations to remind me of the gift I have at hand. Cause it's not a, it's not one of those gifts that once you get it, you hold on to it, but it's always, you have to cultivate it. Right. You know, mm -hmm. one mistake, you know, with activism, it's not like other things that people will forgive you, you know, entertainment, you could be an entertainer doing all type of stuff, athlete, right. folks will forgive you. And, but with activism or anybody in ministry, we're held to a higher standard. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. I happen to be a minister and an activist. So I got, I got it worse. So oh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> they love me today, but if I make one, they're, they're looking oh, for yeah. that. Aha. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. you know, so one mistake and the gift is over with. Nobody oh. cares oh. about what I've done. Nobody cares about who I fed, who we organized. Right. All they care about is look at what he did. Okay. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a gift that could be overwhelming, but I wouldn't change for anything in the world. Okay. Because yeah. they're actually out there sometimes looking for you to make that mistake. And not realizing for you, that's a lot because you build it up and people forget so quick all what you achieve in that one era. You know how we normally say lessons learned. Sometimes that lesson is learned from you. But the thing about it is the rest won't let you get over that lesson. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I also was going to ask about the event yesterday. Tell us more about uh, the event that you put on yesterday. So every year I do a... Uh, benefit. It's normally called the Minister Shred Sanders Birthday Celebration and Benefit. So uh, this year was my fourth annual. Normally we do it at night. We get like a banquet hall. It's like a black tie affair. It's very, everybody's dressed up, looking nice. We do a war presentation. But because of COVID, you know, it, it, it's just really impossible. And I didn't want to have to do it and then put a limitation on and people don't want to come and then people got on masks. And it was just mm -hmm. like too much. So I said, you know what, let's still do something because, I, you know, when you have things that's annual, you know, to me, it's important. You can't just cancel that. So I would say, you know, right. this is the fourth year, but I just said, let's be creative. So every Saturday, New Era Las Vegas, we serve anyway with our Mary Wesley's grocery program. So I said, you know what, let's just meet up in the community. Let's give out resources. Let's have a DJ and let's have some fun. And so it still felt like a party. We danced, we ate, we had a good time okay. Okay. and the community right. got, got serviced. So, you know, I, I plan to obviously continue to build it up. And I think what I may do is I think I may do uh, in the future when things get better. I think I may do a daytime thing okay. of mm -hmm. the service, and I think at night I still may do the the black tie because I, I like that. You know, I, I feel good. You know, right. just the service, the service, and the activism for me, it's not an on and off switch, right? right. Because right. it's my passion. For some people, it's a hobby, right? But right. Me, it's a passion, yeah. you know. And people can understand, you know, why are you so obsessed with this and that. But it's like when you find your purpose, when you know what's your true reason for living. Right. There's no on and off switch with that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like some, of, some people feel their job was here to be parents or their job was meant to be educators or their job was meant to be a mentor in the community to young men, whatever that looks like. When you, <clears throat> when you have your passion, you can't just turn that on and off. Okay. So for me, it's like I always look for opportunities to serve and to further, you know, help organize the community. So it was, it was highly successful. We gave, I think, at least 20 uh, grocery bags. I mean, people just walking off the street. Oh, the area we were beautiful. in is one of the traffic areas where you know people see dj and food they're like what's going on so right. some folks just came wanted to see what's happening okay and, you know and they, they got resources we gave them blankets and so and, and the way we we the way we put the word out was your entry fee because normally when i do my, my my nightly birthday party it's a fundraiser so people bring money mm -hmm. paid in the door mm -hmm. it's like 20 20 entry fee and then all that money goes to a nonprofit that we chose they're invited to the banquet, so they, they're on the flyer. They know they're going to receive the money. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the night, we give them the money. But in this case, I say, you know what? We need to really fundraise for New Era because, you know, we have a lot of projects we work working on. I've never gave the money to my own personal organizations, even though mm -hmm. for the first three years, I was doing all Shades United. But I said, you know what? You know, we got to look within home at this point and really okay. give us some resources. So it was successful. I, I enjoyed it. People came out and, you know, we had a good time. And how can people learn more about that in terms of con you have contact information for uh, future uh, events, uh, uh, this specific uh, future event? You know, for well, this specific year. event, is, I'll always put, right now, my website is still getting uh, built up. Uh, yeah. But in the meantime, between time, I always have Facebook, Stretch Sanders, and then my Instagram is underscore official underscore stretch. It seems like Instagram's becoming the new website. So right. <laughs> <laughs> two ways uh, contact me and you know man it don't stop you that's one right. you know that's that's such a large event and large piece of my life but that's really one piece of the puzzle we do so much 365 and that's why I literally when i always say we serve 
every month. I'm not playing. I kick the month off serving. And then from December, we do our surprise Black Christmas that we give a family, you know, toys and, and stuff to their doorstep. Mm. It's 365. And then we take oh, a week yeah. off and we start right back over. Oh, so man. that's 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 the greatest thing about the work I've been doing from all shades United days, you know, back in the when early days we first connected all the way right. to now. It's just been an evolution. But the one thing that has remained is service. Okay. So, oh, yes. Serve the people. And, and one other thing, too, uh, you're originally from Chicago. Uh, tell us, you know, I guess the time frame you were in Chicago and then when the family relocated to Las Vegas. Tell us about that uh, geographic transition. Absolutely. So my mother had always said that she would never leave Chicago mm -hmm. unless it was out of state because, you know, for most people when we leave Chicago, they moved to like Tennessee. It's a lot of us in Tennessee or they moved to like Minnesota. Okay. Which at that point, you know, you, if you leave in Chicago for certain reasons, you, you're going to go to a, another place with the same people. Right. But surprisingly, Vegas has a lot of Chicago people, but we're not all clumped together. Okay. But me and my twin brother, we really could never really live our best lives, as they say. <laughs> we were right. always yeah. on pins and needles because, you know, you're so much street, so much conditions around you. My brother started trying to, you know, game bang. He found that life to be attractive. Mm. And, you know, and I never did. I always was like the one that was into music and had an older spirit. But my brother was always kind of trying to, my twin brother, mm -hmm. curious about their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So one day I asked my mom, I said, why can't we move to like California or someplace? So she took it seriously and was like, well, I won't do California because it's really fast paced. Right. But I would consider Las Vegas. So she randomly made a post on Facebook and she said, think about relocating to Vegas, you know, information or whatever. So people start commenting, like, my cousin's in Vegas. She loves it. My uncle's in Vegas. Right. One of my mom's uh, mentees from back in the day, who she mentored as a little girl, she reached out to my mom and was like, I'm here. I've been here 20 years after I got out of the Air Force. I just stayed. So she said, if you are for real, I'll send you some information. So she signed us up for a website. They, I think they still have called Relocating to Vegas, where they basically, mm -hmm. they give you, like, it's like a subscription. And, you, go, you know, you go on the website, and it has, like, apartments a list of apartments it has realtors it has homes neighborhood schools so she told my mom i live on the east side of town so i'll put you closer to me so that way we have access to each other easily mm -hmm. and she said here's some of the complexes you pick the ones you want and i'll tell you the ones that i think it's not really the best fit and then this yeah. is the neighborhood school so my mom picked she showed us you know she said we, we walked it all through together showed me and my twin mm -hmm. we picked the complex we liked the most and then she showed us the high school and at that time it's so funny, I'm kind of embarrassed I said this, but <laughs> I was like, you know, I really don't want to go to a school with a whole bunch of Black people. Okay. And the reason why I said that is just because, you know, obviously I've, I've evolved, and, you know, and my, my level of consciousness for our people has really changed. But at that time, I think that I was so, first of all, I was so frustrated oftentimes with my people because of mm -hmm. the experience I had. You know, I'm going to high schools where, these kids literally sometimes, when I think back on it, act like animals, you know, and there's mm -hmm. no disrespect to them, but it was literally like, where am I? You know, my mom, right. me, me and my brother went to public school from first grade to third grade. In third grade, we got kicked out of the Chicago public school system for fighting and being bad. So she had to find a school. She found a Christian school. Okay. Put us in this Christian school, and they had it where if you couldn't really afford the full tuition, they give you like a discount. So they kind of like gave her half of the tuition because by being two of us, Mm -hmm. She was still paying like a thousand dollars a month for both of us to go mm -hmm. to this school. Wow, wow. And it was from fourth grade. We went, we went from fourth grade to eighth grade. We left in eighth grade because uh, the high school was would, would have been double, like two thousand. Yeah. But just in that time, that's when I got my foundation of like my mom, my mom always kind of kept us around a, a spiritual, I would say, Christian family. But that school kind of really drilled. I think some of the principles I have now in me because Bible that was a class. Uh, the principal, her husband, was the pastor of the church that was attached to the school. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So it was a black couple that owned it. So looking back on, I'm like, wow, well, I went to a school that was owned by black people. Like, I, like oh. it started to kind of see, just tapped in. Even mm -hmm. at, at 10 years old, looking at it like that. But the whole staff was black. The leadership team was black. The teachers was black. Mm -hmm. And it was a Christian-based school. So that school kind of really, it gave us a safe haven. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, my mom put us in the lottery for certain schools, you know, uh, certain prestigious Chicago schools, it just took too long. You know, there's a school in Chicago called Urban Prep, which I would have loved to went to. They're the only school in Chicago where it's an all boys academy. Mm -hmm. It's in the hood of Chicago. 
every year there's a hundred percent graduation rate. Oh man! Oh, wow. Wow. And college acceptance rate. Okay. And these these young men go to school from seven a.m. to five p.m. Oh wow! Every day. But and wow. many many come in as freshmen reading at I think second grade, third grade reading level. Okay. And by the time they get to seniors, they're reading. I mean, it's, it's just beyond their, their years. So I wanted to go there. That didn't work out. So we went from I would say not a preppy preppy, you know, because this school was a little on the ghetto side as far as how they ran things. You know, black people do that. We want to do. Um, <laughs> but I would say it was a little edgy. We went from edgy to lean on me overnight. Oh, okay. Like, oh, okay, I got you. with no Joe Clark. Oh, wow. so that was a culture shock. Like, mama, okay. what is this? You know right. what I'm saying? They smoking weed in the class. They selling drugs. Wow. They talking about who they gonna kill when they get out out of school. I mean, literally, you know, when like they say when when the cat away the mice will play. Yeah. I heard everything when these teachers wasn't around. Now, whether they was bluffing or just shooting the breeze, I don't really know. But I just right. know that was the conversations I would hear mm -hmm. when teachers wasn't around. And oftentimes, when teachers were around, they were disrespectful. Right. If you was a white teacher, they respected you less. Mm -hmm. If you was a woman teacher, they didn't respect you no better if you was black or not. So it was literally like, whoa, I, what, what is really going on? So my brother was enjoying himself because he started getting sucked into that lifestyle. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. We, we live in the same experience, but my experience is like, what is this? His experience is like, what is this? You know, oh, he's it's excited. Too different what is this is. You know, he's mesmerized. I'm terrified. Right. So <laughs> I was just like, man, like, get me out of here. So my mom knew I kept complaining yeah. about that. So yeah. when sophomore year came, she said, you know what? We're going to move March of 2011. Y'all be 16. I couldn't wait to go. But what's so funny, my brother wasn't trying to stay. Oh, which okay. let me know. I think he was just trying to really fit in. His heart wasn't that. But a lot of these mm -hmm. young kids, they trying to survive. I don't think nobody really wants to live that type of life, but they feel like, what choice I got? Either I'm going mm -hmm. to join this organization and survive, I'm going to be an outcast, and I'm going to get jumped, and I'm going to get all the, the extras that come with that. So we can, we looked on our school's website, Vegas High School. Mm -hmm. I saw the principal was white. I said, well, that ain't impressive because my principal was white in Chicago. Right. But then I started seeing what well, they got. Picture, I mean, it looked like a college, like a white movie, you know? Oh, wow. Faces painted and mascot. We didn't even have a mascot in Chicago. Wow. They got actual mascots with the big. I mean, it looked like some, like some UIC, some Chicago, Illinois. Like it looked like a college, and I was like, "This is cool." Mm -hmm. oh, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> now, first thing, did you they know, try to get you on the basketball? I saw team? a couple of black people, which was cool for me. Right. But I wanted to make sure this was not a situation where we got to literally walk in right. and go back to living like that. And we we came to the school and literally. I transferred in with all D's. I think Vaughn had like all, we both had all D's and an F. I think Vaughn had like all D's, an F, and maybe a C. Mm -hmm. But literally after the first semester, we both was at all B's. And then oh, Vaughn okay. got on honor roll. Right. And you know, I struggled with the, with the honor roll because uh, math was always been my, my arch enemy. So I would have like all B's and a C or A's and B's and a C, you know, but we did a literally a 180. Okay, all right, good. Overnight. You know, okay. so it's, it's power and environment changes. You know, we moved okay. into a complex where it was diverse. It was all different races. Okay. It was like 18 kids. And we all was in the same age bracket. Oh, wow. You mm -hmm. know, so we playing tag. We, I mean, we like some big kids. We would stay out to one in the morning on weekends. My, my mama didn't feel uncomfortable. She didn't feel like it wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, we, we had a, a beautiful upbringing. I, I'm, high school is that one memory. If I could redo, I would redo. It was just, oh, okay. <laughs> it was like a dream, you know, and then we, right. we moved. In Chicago, I went from being like the guy where they like, you know, like I was like, when you get in this class, I'm like, I've been here for two years, like ignored. Mm -hmm. right. To we moved to Vegas High School, they they knew our arrival before we got there. Wow! Mm -hmm. the first day of school, when the coach right. found out we had he had two six four people transferring, right. they went and grabbed every coach track. I mean, if my mom wasn't there, she wouldn't have believed me. Wow. Mm -hmm. And they had all the coaches lined up in front of us and was like shaking our hands, nice to meet y'all. Yeah, okay. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so that's, that's one side. Then right. somebody gives me the nickname Stretch. One of the guys, mm -hmm. Lano, tried, this is like my second week of school. He's teasing me because he saw a video game where the guy was skinny with an afro. Uh -huh. And I had a high top fade, but when I would comb it out, it looked like an afro. Okay. So Stretch was first, it was he was trying to like tease me, you know, Stretch. Okay. And uh, he said it. And the coach was like, get in line, stretch. I'm like, that don't sound bad. And then the okay. <laughs> girl say it, hey, stretch. I'm like, okay. And the nickname happened, but time my senior year, you know, I was, I was, I mean, I can definitely tell you, I was hands down, probably the most, one of the most popular guys in my high school. I mean, it was like a dream. Country. I never, 
imagine, and it didn't go to my head. Like I wasn't walking around like I'm the best because I never even thought this would even happen in life. Mm -hmm. So I was almost, every day I was honored. You know, it was a blessing. I, I didn't take it for granted to go to school. Like we, we wanted to go to school. We missed probably mm -hmm. maybe two days of school when we got into that high school. Oh, wow. And so we you never, see. It was like a funeral. We never wanted to in Chicago. I couldn't, I was always, I don't feel good. I don't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we couldn't wait to get up. We had to wake my mom up. Like, my we go to school, you know, it was just, <laughs> all, uh, uh, just a pep in our step, you know? So mm -hmm. that that definitely laid the foundation. So I would always say that Chicago made me, but Las Vegas definitely helped to shape me, you know, because it was mm -hmm. an environment that gave me a break to just breathe, you know, okay. to see different things. So okay. so when you finish, look, you, you're stating uh, the point about you. How about your brother? How did he feel when you got there? He, he, he enjoyed it. I think it was a culture shock for him because he still kind of had that Chicago. So at first he kind of came in like, I'm from Chicago. You know, he had that little, <laughs> we all have that little ego, that Chicago ego when we move. I'm from Chicago. You don't know me. I'm from, you know. And I thought, <laughs> wow. By the time my senior year came, we if you wouldn't know no better, you would have, if you, some things we say, because even now, like, we don't talk like we used to, you know, because mm -hmm. we've been out here for 10 years. So the dialect is kind of going away. So the only difference was you hear certain things. You can hear the Chicago in us, but for the most part, we sound like Las Vegas. Oh, right. So we, right. we blended in. Right. We picked up on the lingo. We picked mm -hmm. up on the terms. So I think that after a while, he learned to accept. He got a girlfriend. They, they still together okay. to this day. They've been together 10 oh, years. They got two good. kids. Yeah. So uh, she's from Chicago. Her family's from Chicago. But he just learned to really adapt. You know, and then we both knew when we moved out here, it wasn't easy because my mom in Chicago, we, she had a good job. We was in a decent, you know, I, I always said we was middle class broke. Okay. We had right, everything right. that we needed or lower middle class, I would say. Okay. But we didn't have all the extras, you know, because the school was mm -hmm. expensive and car note. We moved to Vegas. It was different. My mom was promised a job that didn't go through. Okay. So for six months, she didn't have an income. Mm -hmm. So the money we moved out here with, that was gone between mm -hmm. school fees and, you know, trying to stay afloat. Uh, she put a lot of money into buying a vehicle. She spent like 3000 into a van that was end up being a lemon. Mm -hmm. So that was a big chunk of the savings on top of the couple of thousand for the rent. So it just was like, we went from being here to like here in a matter mm -hmm. of like a night. Okay. So it was times we didn't have food in the refrigerator. I mean, it was like literally like, whoa, how we go from this to that? Yeah. Right. But, you know, it humbled me. You know, I think that's why my drive of service is different because I know what it felt like. Not growing up mm -hmm. in Chicago, people, people think, my real poverty stories was in Chicago, but it really was in Vegas. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. you know, where I really saw like, you know, and it was actually worse because in Chicago, at least all these kids, you know, all y'all, bro. Mm -hmm. We go to school with kids who got two parents, who got the real estate mom, mm -hmm. the law enforcement dad, who got the lawyer auntie. I mean, we go to kids who got resources. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, Chicago don't believe in uniforms. But, I mean, they don't believe in non-uniforms. So they want you all to look the same. Right. In Vegas, it was the opposite. There is no uniforms. Okay. So now we got to worry about keeping up with the latest outfits. Right. And yeah. yeah. You know, we on the bus. We embarrassed about that. Like, it's it was a complete different. But, you know, if, if fake it till you make it was a. Right. Was a <laughs> yep. I think me and Vaughn did all right. All right. <laughs> and, and one other thing I wanted to bring up, one of your mentors is uh, John Bunchy Creer. And you mm -hmm. kind of picked up that torch uh, that he uh, established in Vegas, and and you're carrying that forward. Describe who John Bunchy Creer is, your relationship, and uh, uh, and also some of the uh, things that you did in in that same tradition uh, in Las Vegas. Absolutely. So my my relationship to the Black Panther Party it goes so deep. My grandmother's brother, uh, her late brother, his name was Wade Stepney. He was a member of the Illinois Black Panther Party, a member of the Chicago branch specifically. He was actually supposed to be on Chairman Fred's detail the night he was killed, but he was sent to go to Bobby Rush's house. So my uncle was, I mean, he would give us firsthand stories of the Panther Party. So I remember being young, I mean, my brother would always start little crews. One of our crews was the Black Panther Party. We always oh. was so, this is okay. this is fifth grade. We always was like, man, like these brothers wearing leather jackets and giving out food. <laughs> we was, we was right. always really impressed with that legacy. And when I moved to Chicago, when I moved from Chicago, is when I started kind of getting to my consciousness. I started learning that the Black Panther Party, it wasn't just in, because I always thought it was just in Chicago and Oakland. Right, right. That was the stories I was told. I moved to Chicago, Chicago, I moved from Chicago, and now I'm hearing about the extensiveness of the Panther Party, and there was mm -hmm. chapters everywhere, you know, and I'm learning that it was even chapters in Las Vegas, which I was like, what? That was the yeah. last thing I was <laughs> And so I remember, 
I put a word out saying, does anybody know any history on the Las Vegas uh, Black Panther Party? Because I reached out to uh, brother, you know, Billy Jennings, who's the yeah. historian. Oh, yeah. And uh, Billy, he had Billy told X. me, uh, yeah. to his knowledge, right, Billy X, he didn't know, if the, to his knowledge, it wasn't an official chapter, mm -hmm. uh, which I later found out is not necessarily true. Uh, there was an official chapter. The first chapter in 68 wasn't really official because they never had, like, a sanction from the Panthers in Oakland, mm -hmm. but they were, but they wasn't told to cease and desist. People was aware of them, you know, right. but... Right. Because uh, John Chris said he remember when he would come in town in 69, he would meet up with him. I learned mm -hmm. this like recently talking to him. Okay. So not everybody may have knew, but some people were familiar okay. with that legacy. And John Chris, his father was the second black dentist of the state of Nevada in the city of Las Vegas. Wow. So when John Chris joined the Panthers back in 68, he joined in uh, Houston. Uh, when they were trying to do the People's Party, then they later became the Black Panther Party. Oh, yes. He was sent to Oakland. And when he was sent to Oakland, like in 1969, 70, he would always come to Las Vegas to visit his father. Okay. So he ended up going back to Oakland, staying in Oakland. And in late 77, Elaine Brown took over and she told him to go to Las Vegas to reestablish the chapter. Mm. So he moved here and he reopened the Las Vegas Black Panther Party. And I learned they had a drill team called the Hydromatics. I mean, they did a lot of mm. things. They were a little different. They were... I've learned that Vegas was always unique, even when it came to militancy. Mm -hmm. No other Black Panther Party had a drill team, but they did. Oh, okay. All right. So all right. Okay. That's just like with New Era, out of all yeah. of our New Era Nation chapters, we're the only one to do the singing and dancing. Okay. That's all because right. of where we are. This is the entertainment capital of the world. Yeah, so I learned true. there's a correlation yeah. to that, that, you know, we can't just be Black, Black, Black Power. Like, we got to, right. we may have to sing Black Power, right? right. right. Mm -hmm. feel more comfortable with receiving it. Okay. So uh, John John Bunchy Creer is somebody who uh, I, I got under his wing because I saw that he he knew the landscape of Las Vegas. To me, he's definitely one of those legendary Panther members that, you know, his name is not to me always mentioned because he wasn't like a spokesperson or things like that. So you always hear about, like, I always say like the big seven and eight, you know, Emory Douglas, Kathleen right. Kugler, uh, Elaine Brown, different ones like that. But there are so many Panthers, even like Comrade Stan McKinney in Chicago. He was a Panther yeah. from 68 to 78. You know, right. these brothers' stories need to be told because Absolutely. they saw everything. You know, you join something in the late 60s and leave in the late 70s, you're going from literally James Brown, still I'm black and I'm proud, to literally disco or, you know, oh, wow. yeah. early ages of hip hop. Right. So, you know, then you got some Panthers who stayed in all the way to 81, 82 from wow. 67, 66. That's true. So to me hearing that type of legacy, it was like, man, this this brother, this this is it. And, I, and his, his brother is actually a councilman uh, in, in Las Vegas, Councilman Cedric Creer. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so, you know, his that, the Creer legacy definitely runs deep here, but Bunchy is definitely a brother that I'm teaming up with right now. We're working on trying to get a book project. Me and okay. Bunchy is trying to work on a project. Yeah. Um, I presented an idea to him about um, writing a story about the history of the Las Vegas Black Panther Party. Okay, sounds great. So, uh, uh, right now we're we don't have the full title, but right now we're flirting with the concept of like Panthers in the desert. Okay. The story of the Black Panther Party in Las Vegas. So, you know, I got his permission, got his green light to start working on it and kind of getting my research done. So that we're looking at maybe a a, a year or two, really just depends. Like I said, I would I would love to probably at least get some of the if not released fully, but get some of the research done, at least by, you know, this year when they have the anniversary for the fifty fifth. But if not, you know, we'll give it a give it a few years. I want to do it, make sure it's done right. You know, interview the right people. Right. And the purpose of the book is not to be focusing on other chapters, just like, you know, certain, the, the Dixon brothers wrote their story about Seattle. I want to make sure this book is about the Las Vegas history. Okay. And what's, what's so unique is how uh, Conrad Career was sent here. I, I think that, you know, for him to be able to work in Houston, and Oakland, and come to Las Vegas mm -hmm. under female Black leadership, you know, it's, it's yeah. so many uh, correlations I want to show that's important for today. Okay. You know, that I want to draw on that book. And then fortunately, there's a lot of brothers I'm, I'm meeting with doing my research who were Panthers of the 77 chapter. Okay. And because 77 was like literally yesterday, yeah. uh, they're <laughs> fairly <laughs> young. They're, yeah. they're fairly young. They're not as old as I thought they would be. They like, yeah. some of them was 14, 15 when they joined. So most of them is like 55. 56, well, mm -hmm. I'm 60. Around my age. You know, they, <laughs> they got, you know, it's, it's different. Opposed to some of the earlier Panthers, you know, they're in mid 70s, right. you know, I mean, late 70s. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were young too, but, right. you know, I think Bunchy probably was the oldest one. You know, a lot of them were really young. Like, you know, I think one brother said he just made 59, you know, so wow. I'm, and he's a member of the other nation of Islam now. So I'm, I'm meeting more members and, and more individuals for the book. 
project. So it's going to be a success. Okay. And well, also, oh, go ahead, sweetie. Well, I was going to say one thing for me, I wanted to ask you, I know you ran for office mm -hmm. and I wanted to know what got you into running for office and what was that you ran for? Well, let me first think, first by say never again. <laughs> 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 Big mistake. No. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, excuse me. I ran for mayor. Mm -hmm. People won't believe this, but it literally, I really feel like God had prompted me to do it. I was, I, I go through these phases. I went through one in a while, thank God. But I was going through these phases where I really have to question, almost like, what have I done? You know, has it been worth it? Right. Because you know. People will speak of me, people in power. I have my name floating around and they act like I'm like the black Hitler. And I'm like, yeah. wow. wow, you know, like, what am I really doing to, you know, you think I would be considered a hero, but in so many uh, regards, <clears throat> excuse me, so many people, I'm not. Mm. And so during this time, 20, 2018, I was really kind of like feeling down. And I remember thinking like, you know, I'm, I got all these speaking engagements, we're moving and grooving, you know, mobilization is happening. But I really feel like from 14 to 18, has it really been worth it? Mm -hmm. And literally when I said it to myself, I just, I heard, I just saw it and God said, run for mayor. Mm -hmm. My mom had been walking past and I said, mom, I think I'm gonna run for mayor. I just blurted it out. She's like, boy, you gotta lay down. <laughs> I had convinced everybody. And this is such, this okay. is such, such a powerful um, story for me because I had convinced my whole family, my mom, none of us was voting. Mm -hmm. My mom was like, whatever you do, I'm doing. My mm -hmm. mom, my siblings, friends I was with, we was against politics. Like, ain't we ain't voting. We, we, we had the vote nobody campaign in 2016. That was our movement. Okay. And literally, mm -hmm. I'm like, I do not want to have to back. It was always like when Malcolm X had to kind of go back and backtrack and say, you know what? Mm -hmm. You know, I believe in Islam, but I don't believe necessarily everything I was taught. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that takes a lot of courage. You oh, know, yeah. to have mm -hmm. to go back yeah. and be able to say, April Fools, you know, yeah. like, you know. <laughs> Did I really say that? You know, <laughs> to this day, some folks don't respect that. They're like, no, nah, it must have been a catch. Right. You know, it was an opportunity or something. He don't just go from not voting to voting, but it's just true. I really, mm -hmm. and also people that understand, I don't know why they, why they don't understand this, but I was 19 when I got into this community. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll be 26 on Tuesday. Wow. You're going to grow, right? Okay. I'll, be, mm -hmm. I'll be, in 10 years, I'm 36. I guarantee you, I won't move. I, I'm, I'm moving now. Like, you're going to evolve, but people don't want to never, they never want to let you just move forward. So I told my mom and she said, listen, if you are serious about this, you think this is what God has asked you to do, let's do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we put it, we put it, we put a team together. I became the youngest in Vegas history to run for mayor. So that mm -hmm. was definitely the best. But the reason why I say never again, I'll be specific. Will I run in a different city? Absolutely. At mm -hmm. some point, I would like to leave Las Vegas. I, I would really like to move to like Georgia. Okay. okay. And um, I necessarily can't say Atlanta. I would just say just, I, I see myself moving into like a small town somewhere in the South mm -hmm. that has a lot of issues that's looking for a certain voice. It needs a mm -hmm. spokesperson. It's a high level of poverty, but it still has potential. You know, it's a community there. And I can go out there, you know, and I don't know if areas like this exist in Georgia, but right. um, if it is or North Carolina, somewhere in the South where I can go out there and really be in a in a in an environment where they're used to leaders speaking mm -hmm. truth power, they're used to leaders, you know, from the kings and you know, oh, yeah. all these civil rights leaders we, we seem to forget they were from the south. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's true. Civil rights was foreign to the north. That came later by those in the south. Right. You that's know, true. so I want to be able to be in an environment like that. And I think Las Vegas, politics is just different. You know, here mm -hmm. you can't speak any truth to me, any real truth to power and be this. We, we're always looking for that black power political candidate. And right. some mm -hmm. cities will never allow that. Okay. And Las Vegas is one of them. It's one of them cities where you really, when they say play the game, they're not playing. Okay. All you right. know, And oftentimes it's like the game may end up playing you. Right. And that to me is where I can't, I just can't, I can't compromise that. You know, I am learning that as a leader, you know, I don't have this, I don't have certain luxuries right. and I do certain things. The old me was, oh, we don't meet with them. We don't talk to them. We don't work with them. Right. But in where I am in my uh, activism experience, it just doesn't work like that. You know, when you have a certain power you have, as much as giving much is required. So mo more is required of me. 
Okay. So certain meetings I didn't want to take, I don't want to meet with that elected official or that law enforcement officer or whatever. It don't work like that. You know, right. we, we got to be strategic, you know. Now, that don't mean we're going to be buddy-buddy. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to sell out my people. I'm not going to be making it seem like we, you know, we, we got our armor on each other. We kicking it. It's not. It's none of that. But it's about strategy. You know, are we strategic? How we moving in this community to bring forth sol- solutions? You say you want healing. That's fine. Whether I agree with you or not, that's your that's your mission. Mm-hmm. I want healing. Whether you agree with me or not, okay, let's figure out how we can do that. Where we can stay out each, other, each other's way. Mm-hmm. You know, again, I'm not no black Hitler. I'm not out here trying to set the city on fire. I'm trying to help the city. Right. But the younger me was, you know, I didn't do politics. I didn't do anybody who was different from me. We don't work with them. Right. And to me, all that did with looking back on it was it made matters worse. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I'm grateful for living, learn experiences. But the the, po- the the political piece, I think the greatest thing I can do is be that one to help coach mm-hmm. and mentor those who want to run for office. Because a lot of us in the Black community, we're not ready. Right. No. You know, we think that politics is a graduation from activism, and it's not. Mm-mm. Not everybody's no. fit to run for office. I think I can do so much good with just being that person who has the resource center, right. speaking on issues, mm-hmm. you know, bringing people together, you know, mentoring, pouring into people. That's what's needed. We need more positions of that. Because okay. oftentimes you see, we get in these political arenas and we switch up. Yeah. And oh, you're yeah. disappointed with them, but I'm learning you can't be mad at them. No, no. You Mm-mm. know them to run for office. That's what they get. They, listen, you making them, get, they don't give up something. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. They get stuck between the hearts. You can't be mad at them. Right. Some of they sold out. No, you told them to run for office. Right. And what got me to understand this perspective was I watched Barack Obama on The Breakfast Club. I, 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 for the last couple of years, I was a big Barack Obama hater. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'm starting to kind of understand where the brother was coming from. I'm not mm-hmm. saying I agree with him all the way. I'm not saying that I still think he could have did more for us. Right. But when I heard this man say, people in the black community were this was disappointed with me because they wanted me to say this and say that and do this. He said, what they don't understand is when you are a politician, mm-hmm. whether you city council or in certain places, aldermen or whatever, certain things is gonna change. Right. especially when you get to a certain point running for president, governor, any mm-hmm. federal or state. Right. He says, often, and this is that course, he said, oftentimes we expect the politician to speak like the activist. And right. the activist to speak like the preacher or the Nation of Islam mm-hmm. member. It does not work like that. Mm-hmm. All these positions require roles. Mm-hmm. When you take on a position, the role will change. Right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oftentimes, we don't understand that. And that's what, it was like a light bulb went up. I was like, whoa. Hmm. And that let me know, you know what? Definitely don't do no politics. Stay in your lane. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, my role. Yeah. I'm thinking that I could get in this role and because I see other people doing it, but I have no idea what that background looks like. I have no idea what they've been advised to not say, to not do, to mm-hmm. not whatever. Right. So for me, it's like, don't look at that like the grass is greener. Right. I think when I ran for mayor, people don't believe me, but at the end of the day, it don't matter. I know God called me to do that. That running for mayor mm-hmm. saved me in a sense because it got me to be open to utilizing, uh, I wouldn't say even politics, but the political vote as a way to build power for our people. Okay. Everything is political. And we sit there and talk about, I don't want to vote. I don't, I'm not saying necessarily even national, but even your school board. Like in Las Vegas, we have no black school board. The lady that ran, the community did not back her like we should have, and she lost. Now we have nobody black mm-hmm. on that school board, trustee, to make sure our black kids get what they need. So I think if anything, so, you did learn some lessons while running and that was, that could have been the only thing that you were supposed to get there for. It was lessons. Because you now you understand the different platforms and why people get into different arenas, but us working collectively together and having a voice in those areas is what the platform should be used for. That's right. I'm telling you that that's the greatest thing. Cause I always say, I lost, but I won. Mm-hmm. And I okay. won in so many ways because I was able to open my, the greatest thing I got from him was saying, you know what? I'm open-minded to entertaining the vote. Mm-hmm. Well, what I will say is that if you think voting is going to save you, you're wrong. Right. Now, mm-hmm. can voting help build forth a strategy? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. We need political power. They, they have commissions and voting and board for your water supply. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to sit here and say, I'm not going to vote, everything is political. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say that Voting needs to be taught to our young people as not the end all be all, but a tool. Mm-hmm. People with people was beating down my throat. You gotta vote. 
our ancestors died so we can vote. That's not true. Our ancestors died trying to achieve freedom. Correct. Now, right. they may die in the process trying to get the vote done, but the end goal wasn't voting. The end mm -hmm. goal was we tired of being mistreated. We tired of going to the top of the level of the movie theater. We tired of going in the back of the door. We tired mm -hmm. of going in the back on the front of the bus to pay, getting off, walking around to the back. We tired of that. It was never about let's just integrate. It was about listen, stop treating us like we the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. That 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 was the whole message. And so they looked and said that man, voting is something that we saw. If we get access to vote, we can vote on our issues. Correct. And what they say. Now let's start actually getting black people to run. But that mm -hmm. wasn't the vision at first. They, they thought that would be unrealistic. Mm -hmm. At some point it became a reality. Let's start getting black people in office. So to me, I always tell young people, you should vote because voting is a way to further build power and argument. We talk about black power. Black power has to be economically, politically, spiritually. Mm -hmm. You know, all that is black Absolutely. power. You can't, you can't physically, financially, you can't just say black power but then you're not raising your children. You're not. You're beating on your wife. You you know you you don't have a good heart. So black power is a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. Black power is economical. You can't say black power. You ain't supporting black owned businesses. Right. So right. it's the same way when it comes to political. Yes. And so when you, because when the only way law changes is if you have that vote even there. So in order to put it on the ballot, what you have to do vote for That's it. Right. So the thing about it is your vote does count. Is in different arenas and different areas. Change politics, all that, the law, if you want something to change, you got to be in the game to help create the change. That's right. Well, I was going right. to say that uh, I, in my book, I had uh, a saying that uh, uh, a platform without a program is symbol without substance. And thing is, you've always had programs, mm -hmm. no matter what. I mean, uh, unity to community barbecue programs, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the patrols that you do, the business accountability. Talk to some of the programs that you have, you're involved in. That's not right. Is that quote your quote? That's my quote. I, <laughs> I, I didn't read it from nobody else. <laughs> I'm on the patent that. <laughs> I got that quote, but I don't think I got your name, name by it. I'm going to have to go and change that. Okay, yeah, I, yeah, do that. I like do that. that quote. <laughs> yeah, I think I just put like, I know, I didn't know if that was your quote or not. I love that. I, I quote that. I quote oh, that to people you, all the time. I say, listen, you know, a, a platform with no program, listen, it's like simple with no substance. I'm always saying through. So thank it's you. definitely, and I got it from your book. I just didn't know, because uh, I, I can't remember if you put your name behind it. If it was just like quote, but I didn't look at it. Or, I get why you did it because right. in the, it's in that book, but I just didn't think about it. But that's a powerful, that's a powerful quote because um, thank you. Thank you. too many times, we create platforms. When we have, when we have programs, we always think that it has to be walking into a building, receiving food. A program to me is action items. Right. 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 What's the action items? There's politicians with programs. The program is I need you to come to this meeting. This is called the the engage the vote rally or whatever. Or uh, I need you to file this this petition. This is called the on the paper whatever. Like programs. People need to have structure. Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of leaders and people, so-called leaders that lead out people with no structure. Right. Mm -hmm. right. What's your program? Right. So as you said, from All Shades United, we had our Lean On Me project, which was every Sunday giving our food and resources. Mm -hmm. We had the Thanksgiving with the people, which was our big giveaway for Thanksgiving. And we did um, the Unity and Community Barbecues every, which we got right. from you guys with the Vanguard. Mm -hmm. uh, we did every, uh, thank, uh, every August of the month. It's programs. New Era for me took it to the next level because I was able to enter an organization that already had structure and programs in place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which was the Streets is Watching Community Patrol, which is the Buy Black Tour, which was the Safe Zones, putting stickers in Black businesses to partner for like safe spaces with communities. You know, and then we created our own programs like the Do for Separate Else class, which is a class to teach about credit, financial okay. literacy, home ownership. Mm -hmm. So we have the freedom to kind of tweak it and make bring new programs, but I can't be a part of any organization or any movement that don't have programs. Right. Mm -hmm. The program can't just be marching. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Now <laughs> that true. can be that can be a form like okay like the program is mobilization to organization. Okay, that's a program. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, what's a part of that program? Okay, three bullet points in the program is we march and protest to bring awareness. Right. Not every day, one day. One specific location, one specific target, hit it, get right. the media, get the story, put it out there, 
action item two, show up to the city council and the county commission to meet. Mm -hmm. We're going to sign people up. We're going to pass our petitions. We're going to pass our flyers. We're going to get folks to come back to the next meeting. Meeting uh, action item number three, have them come out to a park or a rally or a household meeting to organize more folks and to grow it. So the program is mobilization to organization, but we have three specific things we do within the program. Mm -hmm. That's where I am. Right, I'm okay. past this out there, no justice, no peace, and go back home to nothing else. Right. That's the program. Right. That's a form of awareness, but we can't keep doing things in the name of awareness. I can work right now currently in the name of effectiveness. Mm. Is it effective? Right. And if it's not effective and it's not strategic, I can't do it. I can't afford to do anything else off the whim. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to also, uh, brother uh, Kamal Cyrus wants to give you a definite hello and shout out to you, as well as brother <laughs> Quabina up in uh, Gary, Indiana. Uh, he, uh, he definitely right. wanted to say all power to the people to you, brother. Uh, power to the people, to the brothers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's my focus is it has to have programs. And so when people see programs, I've learned that that's been a greater way to mobile. You, you can pull in a bit a bigger crowd with service mm -hmm. than any rally, any march. Now, you may feel like it's not true because, well, we got 500 here and 100 there. But again, it goes back to quality over quantity. Right. Now, if you just want people just to come out and to, and to be seen. We, you know, we did a rally June 5th. It had 6,000 people. Right. It was the largest demonstration in Vegas for Black Lives and anything. Mm. But the thing about it, most of those 6,000, what are you at now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm working with a solid 30. Mm. So to me, you know, when we give out the resources, anybody that comes to that, that let me know that they're actually here for some type of real substantial, substantial change. Okay. You got people who are reactionary, we know, and, and revolutionary. A lot of us are react. We just want to react. Right. Mm -hmm. right, right. We come out for we emotional. I don't want to deal with emotion. I want to deal with logic. Right. You know, are you, are you go from really spontaneity to position? implementation. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so it's a lot of rhetoric, but where's the theory to practice? Where's the real exactly. deal right. foundation? And so that goes back to what you're saying, you know, with the symbol with no substance. We we need to have substance. Right. Mm -hmm. If it becomes a symbol, that's one thing. What is the substance? Mm -hmm. I was going to also ask, how did arms and flags and all that, but that's not that's not the main goal. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, just like you said about the history of Vegas, a lot of people don't know about it. How did you know about our history in Los Angeles uh, as the third wave of the Path of Movement? Because you said you had no idea we even existed. Uh, with Absolutely. The Path of so, right. so how how did that happen? I think when I when I got on Facebook, I I, I first added all the Panthers in Chicago. And Billy Shea Brooks, he is always either getting his stuff shared from Billy X. Once I got Billy X, it was like, you know, he, he posted stuff every day, literally. Yeah. So I think he posted, I think, an article, you guys, and he said, you know, our legacy keeper or something like that. And I remember um, seeing your picture because he shared a picture of you when Chairman Fred came home from prison, something right. like that. Right. So I just started connecting with, once I got with you and I discovered, like, Whoa, this is a real deal because that that that's a story. I, I tell you, they always say I think people need to really know about that because people don't really realize that the Panthers did have successors. They look at the new Black Panthers as successors, but they may have been inspired by the Black Panther Party. But it's one thing saying this is people who we know are going to carry on our legacy, and this is folks who are choosing to carry on our legacy. Mm -hmm. And so, whether we agree that they do or not, I think that when you guys came on the scene with members of former Black Panther Party chapters, automatically that's going to stamp because to my knowledge, nobody who is a former member is active of new Panther movements. But when you guys came on the scene in the 90s, it's like, you know, you got members who are stamping you. You know, I saw oh, yeah. pictures and articles of, right. you know, you guys did your giveaway at the uh, Marla Gibbs Center or, yeah. mm -hmm. and people came out and supported that who were former members and current of your organization. I was like, whoa, they got an office and oh, yeah. I saw y'all working with <laughs> punk groups and oh, yeah. that was powerful. He's punk, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and needed, I'm sure, for LA back in them oh, days. You absolutely. Know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you know, I know you guys that did branch out, you did uh connected with the United Panther movement, which they do consider another successor of the Panther movement. So I was really impressed. And that kind of and that even though all said United was a different in terms of name and objective it was important for us to say, you know what, we also want to be legacy keepers in our own way. Right. You know, mm -hmm. I was I was a member for a short while of the Black Panther Party Cubs with Chairman Fred Jr. in Chicago. Okay. And that organization definitely gave me some principles, really understand 
the importance of everything is political and the importance of the Black Panther Party legacy. So I still carry on a lot of things. And that's why I take the Panther legacy seriously. You know, I am a Panther at heart. I may not, I don't have to be a part of a Panther organization, but right. Right. I'm a Panther cub at heart because at the end of the day, the Panthers inspired all of us. Anybody who came under that 1966 banner, right. we all, nobody had never saw. They was they were Panthers and was shocked when they were like, did, that, did we really just do that? Right. So right. <laughs> they were even mesmerized with themselves. So I, you, right. you know, we're going to be impressed. And so the Panthers to me is more than any organ other black organization, hands down inspired and sparked, you know, what it really means to be a vanguard, what it really means to be mm -hmm. policing your own community, what it really means to be doing for self. You know, of course we had great movements before that, like the nation Islam and the Garvey movement and, Right. Uh, the, the Morris and Noble Drew Ali, but to see the Panthers come on the scene during a time where many organizations was not approaching it that way. Mm -hmm. right. you know, that to me was like, it was needed. And it goes back to saying how we all play a role, right? The Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. they were needed because we needed to be told that the Black man is God. We need to be told mm -hmm. that we're not, you know, inferior, we're superior. We need, during that time, we needed that. A lot of Panthers, you know, the Panther movement was to spark because of them being inspired by Brother Malcolm who's yeah, a product of a life Absolutely. Right? So we needed brothers and sisters seeing you go from a prostitute to you cleaned up with a, mm -hmm. with a dress on. You know, you went from being a killer to now, you know, you wearing a suit mm -hmm. and got a family. That was needed. And we also needed the, the Garvey movement to teach us yeah. about mm -hmm. owning and ownership and right. having our own yeah. nation yeah. and independence. And inspiring. And, absolutely. So the Panthers came on like, okay, Malcolm, we appreciate what y'all doing. Garvey, I see what y'all doing. Mm. And we gonna be young people, college students, street cats. Right. We're gonna put on jackets and we're gonna get out here and we're gonna take control. And it and it took it took the country by storm because it was never seen. Mm -hmm. So when you guys came on the scene saying, hey, we're gonna revive that, mm -hmm. I think it's important because we often talk about how, you know, historically as a nation, there's not a lot of movements you really hear that was really happening in the 90s. You know, right. we do know that the Me and Man March kind of set a tone. Yeah. for what that mm -hmm. looked like but you know it was more 90s, symbolic. i would yeah. say yeah mm -hmm. the 90s was a rebuild period because you know from the 50s 60s we have the civil rights movement mid late 60s we have the black power movement by the time the 80s came it was the crack movement right, right. 90s we still struggling so you got the the vanguard popping on the scene and the, and the me and man march all these different things it's almost like you're going against a major force because you're trying to you're, you're going against that beast with the crack it was still existing absolutely mm -hmm. trying to really revamp and then there's this pause, right? Where all the way to 2000, the early 2000s, there's no real mass movements. Right. Mm -hmm. Except for when they popped up with like the Jericho or the Mumia Abu Jamal movements, continuing that, or the reparations movement. Right. And then from 03, after the, rep the reparations movement died down after the 9 11, 01, 02, now you go from 2001 to 2012, there's no mass movement. We got political movements, obviously Obama getting elected, things like that. Right. So we really went, we had almost a 10 year period of no national, and you got different groups locally working right. in different cities, but no national. So then when this Black Lives Matter thing came on the scene, mm -hmm. you saw a lot of us coming out there with Panther shirts on and right, hoodies right. that said Free Huey. And you, so you start really seeing not only was the, the vanguard of the 90s inspired by the Panther movements. Here is folks who we know doggone well wouldn't even thought of with the Panthers mm -hmm. on the scene. Right. Now, you know, I was born in 95, so if anything, I'm a product of what y'all was doing, not what they right. were doing. Right. And now you see the emergence of all these young leaders. I got plenty of pictures of me marching out there with, you know, uh, Black Panther Party shirts on and mm -hmm. free human yeah. and right. you know, he would have been free and, and some more since then. <laughs> <laughs> Transition. <laughs> They were saying free Huey. Right. You know, right. a lot of us thought Huey was still living in prison. Oh, but no. that just showed <laughs> that the level of, you know, not necessarily ignorance, but the level of inspiration, right? That yes. you know, we saw this history and we just we 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 thought it was still current. Mm -hmm. You know, and so the, the Panther legacy and anybody who came under that legacy is going to continue mm -hmm. to keep that legacy alive. All I could say is we don't want to ever get caught up in the name. Right. And just get caught up in the work. It's all about service. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. we, we all owe a great deal to the sacrifices that the Panther Party made. You know, many was jailed. Many are still in jail. Mm -hmm. The political stance. All we can do is learn from their mistakes and move differently. You know, mm -hmm. and move differently, move better. Mm -hmm. You know, because mm -hmm. Quantel Pro ain't went away. You oh, know, no. it's still oh, no. So we got to really, and this is not to be afraid. This is just say, you know, watch how you move. That's how a, lot right. of, a lot of Panther chapters went down because of not the leaders, but who they were affiliated with, who they were associated with, 
influences. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about just being strategic. So I'm learning that it's all about strategy. Everything we do is about strategy. So, you know, my next one I got to ask is, yes. may, what made you write your book? So my book, My Father's Best Kept Secret Child, in fact, the anger to heal and that story was inspired. I was actually, it was a guy, I wish to this doctor I could figure out who he was so I could thank him. But I was at a um what was that a store out here called Mario's. And this guy said, I'm from Milwaukee. We was having like a like a circle of us talking us at the store. He said, you know, I write books, I do this, I do that. And he says, um, you know, who else got books? I said, Well, I don't have a book, but you know, I want to write one, but I said, I don't know what to talk about. I got too many topics. I said, you know, I you know, I, I could talk about this, I could talk about that. I could talk about how I was my father's um, best kept secret child, yada, mm -hmm. yada, yada. He goes, that's your book. Mm -hmm. There it is, yeah. Mm. And he said, uh, he said, uh, best kid, what, what, what my father's best kid? He said it was a best, he said secret child, something like that. And I uh, looked up and there was a lot of books that was called Secret Child. Mm -hmm. So I said, I kept hearing people say, best kept secret mm -hmm. and I said my father's best kept secret child because I do feel like me and my brother was definitely a best kept secret it, my mother had you know two phenomenal young men that my father's whole family didn't even think was even in existence wow. mm. and for us doing what we were doing and to even do what we're doing now and nobody was aware of that that's like that's that's not a bad secret to keep right because then it's like wow look 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 who we really are right. and so I got the work, man. He planted that seed. I was like, that's the book. I paused other book projects I was doing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm writing, I'm writing that one. That's it. Okay. And before the pandemic happened, I was like, I was dragging my feet. Mm -hmm. I had maybe a chapter here, chapter. I knew I would do about six chapters. Right. But then we was, uh, we still got to about the end of March and they're like, you know, stays closed. Well, I said, well, this is, a, this is a good time to start on your book. You ain't going nowhere. Mm -hmm. You ain't going nowhere. Man. And I started writing. I was up to three in the morning. I mean, I was just writing. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? I'm going to release it in June. I was able to beat my goal and I released it in May. Okay. And I was like, okay, it's on. You well, know, and yeah. book to me is such a, it's such a profound book because I want to focus on more dealing with what black men and women go through, but specifically with the brothers on how we deal with the absence of the father. Mm -hmm. Right. I think oftentimes we romanticize that because my mother was one. She never bashed my father, but she would be like, don't focus on him, you know, just be glad y'all got a good mother. But she never gave us the tools to understand that you could normalize not having a man around, mm -hmm. but that's the thing. You having a husband, not saying like me having a father, you know, mm -hmm. there's certain principles that I need. And I think women do it to protect the children. I think the downside of that is that it also dismisses the pain that these young men are really going through because mm -hmm. we try to mask it up and we have what we hurt. And this is why Think about it. If all these young men that's out in the streets, where they fathers at? Right, right, right. right. So true. Mm -hmm. so you know, true. and if yeah. others is behavior, which I don't believe all of them are, I'm gonna let dog in the back. All right, <laughs> all of them are. You know, that's what's married do to you, right? Marriage gets you a dog. I just, I was like, dog and we're dog now. lovers. <laughs> okay. And so, uh, you know, I, I look at and I said, man, if all these fathers were active and right. pointed to their sons, like my brother, I know. He would have been better when Chicago, but mm -hmm. he chose that life because he felt like that's the way to go. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, you need to have people in place to, it's yes, it's important to have mentors, but we can go back and get these fathers. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write a book and I mentioned, I even spoke to fathers. I'm like, listen, if you, you know, if you are not raising your child, it's not too late to make it right. Okay. Right. A lot of fathers have this pride. They feel like, my son's not gonna talk to me. That may be true, but plant the seed. Give, send a letter. Send him mm -hmm. a letter. Hold yourself accountable. Don't come in with this. But I was young. Ain't nobody hear all that. Mm -mm. Apologize. Make it right. Give it some time. And if they choose, it's on you or not. But either way it go, that's a consequence. Right. But don't just take the the coward road out. And so, you know, when I ran for mayor, my father, I sent him the, the flyer. He was like, "Wow!" I'm, he was shocked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He happened to call me the day I was going to file for the for the candidacy. Mm -hmm. So he says, uh, uh, "What you doing? Something to go file for, for the mayor?" He was like, "Wow, son, you really running for mayor?" I said, "Yeah." So I always asked him about how his family was. We knew about them. Now that's the kick part. We knew about right. his mom, children. They just didn't know about us. Mm -hmm. So next thing I know, two days later, my brother called mom and screaming like a girl. Dad told his kids about us. 
Mm-hmm. And he had told his kids, he told his daughter, he said, you got two sons, you got two brothers in Vegas. One of them's running for mayor. And he said, I'm going to call you back and hung up on it. She's like, what? <laughs> what? Wow. Okay. Because she was, at the time, she was 20, I want to say 26. Mm-hmm. And, um, but she was, she was told that she was the youngest. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm really the youngest. So she like, what? Wow. She's the only girl with all these brothers, literally. Mm-hmm. And she was just like, shut up. Like, what is really going on? So we ended up rekindling and our, our siblings, all of us are pretty close. Right. Uh, we did lose a brother. We lost one of our brothers in February of last year. Oh, he sorry to hear that. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. But I, I was, I'm so grateful that we had a chance to connect. I, he's the mm-hmm. only one I didn't physically meet because when we came to Chicago to try to see him. He was saying he wasn't feeling well, but he would call us before we left and he never did. But many of us believed that he was sick then. You know, oh, okay. Mother and his mother, she, you know, she says that, you know, she didn't know, but I think she knew. I think they all mm-hmm. knew. Because the way that his mother and the calmness, it's almost like when you watch your child, it's different. When you get the call saying your child got killed at two in the morning, it's different than when you see your mm-hmm. child literally transitioning out of here. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. You know, well, when they're brother- in the house mm-hmm. and you got a chance to spend time with them and pray with them and, you know, and mentor them, mm-hmm. that, that's a total different. Uh, ball game and just getting this unexpected call. So I think that based on her strength, I think that she knew. I think that he knew, and that's exactly why he didn't want us to come see him. And uh, February, he he, he transitioned up out of here. But we had we talked all the time. He talked. He sounded literally like a replica of my dad. Mm-hmm. And then one of our brothers, we knew. Uh, we met him years ago. We t- spoke with him, and um, now we just have a brother and sister left who we uh, we talk to on a regular basis. So it's 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 an extreme blessing. They read the book. They like the book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, well. And speaking of my mom, personally, I, I just thought it was very riveting, very emotional, mm-hmm. uh, very, very much, uh, uh, you know, about how, you know, we have these secrets within Black families a lot mm-hmm. of times, uh, extended families, close families, and, and your book really hit it on the head. Uh, it was just a, a 24-7, 365 view of uh, some of the contradictions within black families and then the the uh, the revealing of, of certain things that always need to be revealed. That's right. Yeah. And how, how would people get a copy of that, brother? So the book, uh, people can do two ways. They can order through me. They go to Stretch Sanders on Facebook or underscore official underscore stretch on Instagram. They can order it like basically just saying, hey, I want to get a book. I'll send it to them, mm-hmm. uh, but I'll sign it. Mm-hmm. If they do Amazon, then they have to go through the, you know, obviously getting it from them. Amazon do not send to us first, so it goes straight from the warehouse mm-hmm. uh, to the, from the manufacturer to the people. But I, that's a book that I want to get in every Black family, especially in the hands of fathers Absolutely. who didn't have fathers or fathers who may be struggling with raising their children or whatever, because it, it's, and, I, and there's more books where that come from. I want to focus on more self-help books to deal, you know, with the Black man and deal mm-hmm. with that father topic, because again, I think we learned to romanticize it where we downplay it. You know, my father wasn't there, you know, teen, no daddy. It's like, we shouldn't be clapping on that. Like, that's not oh, good. Yeah. We learned to normalize that. It's not normal. Well, and Unless I was going to say, w- one of the things just to give a plug in on uh, Black men that are fathers, I was actually raised up until the age of 11 by a single father. And so my dad raised us and we were four kids starting at two months up to, at that time, it was like five or six years old. So we were all babies. He worked three jobs to take care of us until the age of 11 when he remarried. But the thing about it is there are great fathers out there as well, and there are bad mothers. So the thing about it is sometimes it's not one side, sometimes it could be the other. And we are a creation of what we grew up and how we grew up. So like some people state at the time, well, how could you not like your mom? Well, guess who took care of me? My father did. So the thing about it is at that time, it was as a child, you only saw the one that took care of you because without that parent, I wouldn't be here. I could right. not fend for self. So as we learn and as we grow, like you're saying, the reach out, the communicate to, but part of it is you have to let people also heal on their own time because it right. does take time to come back so and heal from that. And as I read in your book too, that sometimes you too still have that struggle that you have to pull yourself out of it. It's the same for a lot of people. Oh, and yeah. I, I appreciate you doing that as well and talking about it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I still battle with it. It, it, it became tough when we, we was excited that we met our siblings, but then it became a slap in the face 
when we realized like, what the world? Like they they got our brothers, I would say they didn't necessarily get it better than the only difference between us and our brothers is that they got child support we did not receive. They knew his family and you know they had they had access to him at <clears throat> graduations and things like that. We didn't have that. I got on social media and I saw that, you know, my brother had posted a picture of, of him and dad at his kindergarten graduation. We didn't have that. I can't even imagine what that feels like to have him at kindergarten, eighth grade, high school, nothing. Nor did he care. Mm-hmm. So when I think about that, then my sister, he raised her. Her and her mom were, um, her mom and him was together till she was 18, 19. Okay. And I was 14 at the time. So even as a child, like I said in the book, when my dad was still coming up to my home, he was still with her mom. We did not mm-hmm. know that. And so she actually had the two-parent household, you know, her whole life. Mm-hmm. I did. So we read something, it made us feel like, man, like why did we get cheated out of a deal? But now, mm-hmm. and even when the book was completed, it helped, it literally helped me heal because I was emotional writing it. It, it, it pulled out things I thought I was over with. Um, it let me know I I I, I hadn't forgave him like I thought I did. It was mm-hmm. a different level of forgiveness. Cause I'm reminiscing about like, man, like I'm happy for them. I'm happy that we know them, but now I'm getting pissed. Right. They're like, you know, when I'm hearing how they was raised and I'm hearing how they upbring opposed to us when it's like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I'm saying like, we, like my mom literally, we could have been at, we could have stayed at the Christian school longer if my dad would have been paying child support. Like all these mm-hmm. things, I could not, I could have, I could have avoided the lean on me experience. Like I could have, but that's all could. But then I think about, Everything happens for a reason. And so right. if he was involved, I wouldn't have been in Vegas. And I'm going to to Vegas was the best thing happened to us. So mm-hmm. I can't live in regret, but it's always mm-hmm. a constant battle of like, man, I, and even now I want him to be the dad that calls me and check on me. I'm proud of you, son. But he doesn't have the capability. So I call him, we talk. Combos are getting longer. They went from being five minutes. Now we, we pushing 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of my one of my mentors and friends told me he said we have to stop expecting people that got two seaters mm. to fit four people, mm-hmm. and that's what we're doing. Mm. That's what we're doing. We expect somebody he does he doesn't he does he just cannot do it. He doesn't know any better. Okay. Mm-hmm. I sit and say all day long with yes he does and then he doesn't he doesn't have that capability. He doesn't have the ability to be able to do that. And so why be upset? You know I have right. a child on the way. I have niece and nephews. I can just be that father figure. I'm going to be a father in the flesh. Right. Just chatting that differently. So when I said in the book, let your pain produce purpose, I meant mm-hmm. that. Don't sit there and live with that pain. Do something with it, you know. But right. fathers or absent mothers have to understand that what you do to a child and what you don't do for a child is going to determine the child is going to become an adult. Mm-hmm. So you don't have the, you don't have the luxury to say, well, you know, just forgive me and get over it. It don't work like that. Like, no. You know, I, my life is the way it is because of what you didn't do and what you did do. Mm-hmm. So you know, that's something that he has to be held accountable for but it doesn't mean accountability means i'm going f that dude you know that from that type of energy right. it's like hey i understand what happened and when i figured out the whole secrecy thing it made more sense mm-hmm. okay. All right. we always thought my dad didn't love us or he didn't like us it was personal when i discovered that he cheated on his long-term girlfriend with my mom mm-hmm. you know it's like okay he didn't have the he didn't have the capacity to do it own up to it, mm-hmm. say, sorry, I did the wrong thing. No, he chose to, I'm going to ride it out. And sometimes, as I stated in the book, we get in such a deep hole, we either give up, we don't want to climb out, we say mm-hmm. it's better to stay in, we learn to make that hole home, or we get out. Mm-hmm. And we can't climb in holes and accept that hole. It's a, mm-hmm. a hole is a dark place. Who wants to be in a dark place? Now, you can sit there and try to put light and try to spritz it up and make it look like a home, but it's still a hole. Okay. So, you know, we have to be mature enough to climb out of that and, and to start over. It's never too late to start over and to make something different. And I think that's what my father struggled with. But the blessing is, you know, we have access to each other mm-hmm. and I'm able to now be that kind of almost like a mentor to him. He doesn't fully mm-hmm. know everything I do, but I'm, I'm slowly kind of creeping in a little bit of what mm-hmm. I think, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and so and so many people have wrote me like, man, that book has blessed me. Mm-hmm. Oh my Absolutely. God, thank you for writing this book. I'm, it was so touching. So it, it's it's touching who needs to touch and it's healing who needs to be healed. Mm-hmm. And I want to continue to push that book. Um, I was at this point, I wasn't able to do it how I wanted to do it. I wanted mm-hmm. to do the speaking tour and all that. That was all lined up. But right. to still better sell copies on a pandemic is, is a success to me. Oh, absolutely. And what's important with my with my ministry and my movement 
is to change, transform. If somebody read that book and was able to get on the road of forgiveness, you ain't gonna forgive them. Right. But on the road to forgiveness, mm -hmm. that's a success. You know, at least you understand, you forgive yourself. You know, it's not personal. Mm -hmm. Those are principles I wanted to highlight in the book. And I feel like if people read and that's what they receive, that's what they take, then I, 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 can, I can appreciate that. Yeah, because I'm going to just stay, not going to go into details, but one of my favorite part was the part when you discuss the action and the reaction. So mm -hmm. that's for the listeners to go out and get in order to understand. But that was a good concept in the way you actually stated it. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate <laughs> you guys for enjoying the book. Maybe a Lifetime movie one day. Oh, yeah, maybe. Thank yes. You. Well, well, brother, as we uh, go ahead and sum it on up, brother, I, I want to definitely congratulate you on uh, first marriage. <laughs> And, uh, and then you have uh, expectations, a, a, a expectations some, as well. I, how to say increasing the family, I heard. Right. Congratulations. Right. But Thank I want you, you to talk about your T-shirt, uh, Stretch for Change Foundation. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that, uh, you know, what it's about and how people get, uh, uh, you know, support it and, and uh, reach, I guess, contact you uh, in that regard. Yeah, so the Stretch for Change Foundation, it's, it's really about, it's more so a family Buck Community Foundation. You know, New Era Las Vegas is my heart, but New Era Las Vegas is a part of an organization that is a part of another person's legacy. Right. You know, and I wanted to have my own legacy. I have something that my daughter can carry on. She may not want to do New Era for whatever reason, but she knows that, you know, my father created this. My mother's the president of our board. Like, this is something that's family oriented. So, the Stress for Change Foundation is about me upholding and carrying on my legacy. You know, as Stretch Sanders, I believe that. You know, why wait till you go and want somebody to start a legacy or foundation for you? Like, no, I'm doing it now. You know, and if mm -hmm. people don't think when I go, it is what it is, but tomorrow's not promise. So like the old song say, don't, you know, don't don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. Correct. So I want to do something where I can actually be able to have a have a legacy that I can be able to share with the world what stretch is from public speaking, from you know, learning how to public speak, you know, being able to just kind of share the gifts that I know from a personal standpoint of healing and forgiveness. And no one to step a name on that. Not to say that we can't do it with New Era because we are doing some of that, but just for change to me, it's just, it's, it's just Minister Stretch as a brand. Okay. Mm -hmm. and so that's really what it is. It's my personal brand. You know, New Era, Las Vegas, New Era Nation definitely pulled the best of me out, but I was already Minister Stretch before I got with New Era. So mm -hmm. people have to also know that is that, you know, I do have my own entity and I want to leave behind something that, you know, that my family and I'm going to have a door. I want her to be able to see, you know, her father on a t-shirt, you know, this is mm -hmm. my picture, this image of right. my silhouette, you okay. know, this is my nickname. And so she can be proud and say, man, this is my father's brain. So <laughs> I've always been legacy minded, you know, uh, the fact that she could pick up a book that her daddy wrote, you know, this is a book mm -hmm. that my father wrote, you know, imagine them show and tell gifts. That's what yes. I want to do, to give her a reason to be proud. Like, man, my father really doing something good, but what, but, but it has to be documented, right? So where's the yes. documentation? Yeah. And so if it ain't documented, it didn't happen. So I'm always thinking about legacy and how can it not just inspire my own uh, immediate uh, descendants, but those who are in the community, right? To better see, you can come from Chicago and write a book. That was never a dream of mine. I never thought that was even possible. Mm -hmm. I always thought authors was white. You know oh, what I'm okay, saying? Right. Like, <laughs> black authors. Like seriously, I, didn't, I yeah. growing up, you would have never told me I wasn't exposed to black authors, mm -hmm. but I'm around more black authors today than ever before. Mm -hmm. wow. You know what I'm saying? I didn't never knew that nobody in my family, I'm the first person in my family to write a book, like in my whole family, you know what I'm saying? So that's something that it's never been done. So I didn't know that that was a normal thing. I didn't know that, you know, that was like, we did that, we thought like that, and this is our picture on the back of the book. So mm -hmm. everything I do is always about make sure we're leaving behind a legacy for our families, our communities, because your legacy is more important than your life. Right. You know, your mm -hmm. life is temporary, but your legacy is everlasting. You know, right. it is unless you got some some skeletons in the closet and even with they in, <laughs> they gonna always reiterate that. They always talk about Hitler. Why? Right. That's the legacy he left behind. It wasn't a good legacy, but it's a legacy. Right. So, you know, we have to make a choice, you know, what type of mark would you leave on earth? Are you gonna leave a mark of being a, they, they tremble when they hear your name or are you a brother they respect, that they honor and they revere? Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to do. And so the Stress of Change Foundation is just a, it's a sum up of all of that, all of me, you know, here to say, hey, we I came, I left my mark, this is my foundation. Mm -hmm. It's about carrying on the legacy of Minister Stress Sanders, which is feeding, clothing, loving, empowering. And so, you know, in the event that I have my demise or whatever the case may be, there's a foundation here to carry on the legacy of my work that I single-handedly touched and stamped. 
I felt like MLK should have did. He should have started the MLK Foundation, right? Mm-hmm. He thought he was going to get up out of here. You mm-hmm. know, he should have took the initiative so that way he can he can have control mm-hmm. of. Um, okay, so we got your back. Oh yeah, he can have control of how his narrative is presented. You know, I know mm-hmm. I'm kind of young. I'm already work, gonna work on like a love memoir. I think it's important. Mm-hmm. You know, to better. You know, at least start setting. And I can always do part one, part two, part three, whatever. But you know, I think it's important to better have a series of me telling my own story, right? People don't know the stories of of what I did growing up and the accomplishments. So it's important better show that Minister Stretch is more than what y'all see. Okay. You know, it's more than what y'all think I am. You know, it's Mm -hmm. so much more to me. So I want people to just really get to know me, introduce myself and get people to really know my heart. Wow. Well, brother, I'm so proud of you, man. I've followed you for many years. (laughs) I want you uh, to definitely uh, continue your success, continue the happiness. Uh, you know, looking forward to the uh, seeing your new family. Uh, you know, in a few months. And uh, thank you again for appearing on the Vanguard Show, brother. Thank you, guys. And I'll be. I'll actually be in. Uh, we're going to Atlanta. We'll be in Atlanta. I want to say the end of July. We do our New York Nation tour, so we're touring. So okay. I said I'm gonna make sure I, I pop in and we say hello to you guys. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Come with us, so. absolutely. And we appreciate you coming on as well. And my saying is always: positive thoughts only get positive results. And That's you right. definitely are doing that. And we appreciate all that you do as well. Thank you, thank you, guys, so much. I, I'm honored. I enjoyed myself and my time. Great I happens. look forward to being back on. Oh, I'm proud of the work that you guys are doing. Keep up the awesome work. Oh, thank you thank so much, you brother. Too. You have a good one and uh, and, best to you. And be safe. Thank you, guys. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.